you may or may not have heard of this guy. He wrote eight original songs in this movie we just watched. Please welcome the ever-talented Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> guys. Hello. Oh, we have canines in attendance. This is going to be the best talk back ever. <laughs> well, I could go, go straight into this question, but I, we can make it interactive. Um, did, did we like Encanto? Is it good? Okay. So judging from that, what's been your reaction to how audiences have been responding to the film? Oh my gosh, uh, uh, it's been really exciting. I mean, I gotta say that we didn't know whether it would actually be able to be seen in a theater. That was a, that was a big deal. And actually the entire project we, we produced from our homes and I only saw it on a laptop for two years. And so it was only a few months ago that I saw it on a big screen and my brain exploded and I cried like a weirdo. Um, <laughs> and I was so excited. So then to, to be able to actually go and see it with real audiences in an actual theater has been, uh, Absolutely crazy. Yeah, so phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you for seeing this in the theater. Yeah, thank you all so much. It makes all the difference in the world. I, um, this is probably, I, I think, a combination of all of us working from home during COVID and increased security at Disney. This is the movie I have seen the least that I have worked on because I would get it in sections. It would be like, oh, you're working on We Don't Talk About Bruno. Here is the sequence. You have it for three days, and then it will disappear from your Pix account. Um, and um, so, you know, the first time we actually got to hug uh, this cast and see them in person was at our premiere yeah. um, a month ago. And um, wh what, I, what I love about it is I think it does, I think it, or I, I've, I've had it happen. Um, it does the thing that great Disney movies do, which is it gives you a new vocabulary to talk to your family about things that you maybe didn't talk about. Like I remember coming out of, inside out and being able to talk about emotions in an entirely new way with my kids. Like, all right, does hunger have the wheel? Does disgust have the wheel? Like, who's at the controls right now? And the conversations about family that my family has had uh, in the wake of this, at a New York premiere, my, my date was my sister, and the song Surface Pressure is very much a love letter slash apology to my sister. Uh, older siblings have it worse, or at least they have it harder in my experience, um, and have responsibilities that the, the babies of the family uh, don't always share. Um, and she was there with her kids, um, uh, my nephews, and I remember turning to them and saying, all right, who was who <laughs> in that movie? And I said, because to me, your mom is Luisa. And they go, uh-uh, she's abuela. Uh. She runs our whole lives. Um, but it, it became this amazing conversation about the roles we play in our families and, and how we see ourselves versus how our family sees us. And, and, and to be able to, to, to have really great conversations is, I think, the best hallmark of like a really great family film. Well, full disclosure, I do work for Disney as well. Um, but I am always awestruck about how Disney in general, specifically the animation studio, has such a focus on intentional storytelling, which brings me to Colombia. Colombia! <laughs> how did we get here to Colombia? And um, what were some of the, uh, how did we hone in on those cultural um, uh, sequences and in general. Yeah, well, how do we get there? Uh, it's really easy. I have a very simple answer. Um, I don't. Um, it's, you know, these movies take literally five years. We began this journey a little over five years ago, and we only do it with a ton of help. We have people within our studio, dozens and dozens of people within our studio, and then we make really great connections outside. For this movie, we knew from the beginning we had a songwriter that wanted to do music set in Latin America. He said from the beginning, I would like that. And we said, okay, Lin-Manuel Miranda, we'll say okay to that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so the question was like, so, oh, so where? It's, it's, Latin America is enormous, where do we set it? Um, 
our first discussions were really talking about, like Lynn said, our own families. Uh, we needed to find something that we all had in common that we really cared about. And this notion of perspective in families and different points of view became really, really important. And then we looked at Latin America and said, okay, where in Latin America can we talk about perspectives and different points of view and bring in as much of Latin America as we can without making it a, a sort of a, a fantasy place. We wanted to actually set it in a real place. And we kept on coming back to Colombia because it is such a crossroads of Latin America. Well, naturally, you know, many different cultures and dance and music and food and architecture and of course, magical realism, it's all in Colombia. And so all signs kept on pointing us there. And then we took this amazing research trip about three and a half years ago down to Colombia, where we met some friends of ours that are like friends for life now. Um, and they helped us every step of the way. Disney movies, I think many people think there's a research period and then you're done with the research and you make the movie. And that's actually not how we do it. It is constant research and it never stops. So from that moment forward, Every week we are meeting with really good friends of ours that are helping us build, expanding what we know and have true collaboration in these partnerships that we make. And the music is obviously such an immense part of Colombian culture. There we go. You've written eight original songs in this film. What was that process like for you to really capture the essence of Colombian culture? Yeah, well, first of all, I felt really empowered on, on my experience with which Jared shared on, on Moana. I didn't know anything about Pacific Island culture. I was the last guy hired. Um, and with that, you know, I, this is pre-Hamilton. I was interviewed, I interviewed for the job along with a lot of other songwriters. Uh, and they said, you got the gig, here are plane tickets to New Zealand. We're all ready at a Pacific Island music festival. Like, come join us. Um, and I remember, you know, flying for two days. And um, it was very significant too. That was also the day I found out I would be a father for the first time. Um, so it was like, it was, my my, my wife was going on a business trip. I was asleep and she said, I think we're having a baby. I'll see you later. Like, and I'm asleep. And I was like, okay, what? And then I got the job and then I found out I had to get on a plane. So and then I didn't see my wife for another week um, because she was not back before I had to go. So I had this weird news um, and I've been hired for this job and I met Opataya uh, and Mark Mancina who were already uh, you know, songwriters on the project. And, um, and to see how seriously Disney takes that responsibility and how many resources they give you to get it right um, was really empowering. So I knew that um, we would be given all the resources we need to like dig deep and, and represent this part of the world uh, with love and care and, and authenticity. And all I knew about Colombia going in, other than having a lot of Colombian friends, was the musical, like about the music, was its diversity. Like, there's an amazing salsa songwriter and singer named Joe Arroyo. Um, there's Carlos Vives, who is like a global figure and you heard in the movie. And then like I, I went to high school growing up on brunette era Shakira rock in Espanol. And like that's three completely different genres and they're all from this part of the world. So I knew that it was an opportunity to showcase as many different styles as possible and have them all be uh, authentically uh, Colombian. And so um, that was really exciting. And, and, and again, it goes back to family. That was like, we kept circling like how much of like the, in, the complex dynamics of, of an intergenerational Latino family can we put on stage? Because I know some of you are writers and, and actors, like what happens in the story process is you pare away anything that does not have to do with your main character and their quest. When I was hired for Moana, Moana had eight brothers. Those brothers went bye-bye because Moana had a world to save and we didn't have time. We have no time for the brothers, let's go. Um, and so, you know, we kind of took it as our thesis, like, let's hold on to this family and actually have those relationships be within the story. And I made a lot of big pitches of like, well, music can tell those stories because you can assign themes to characters and you can smash those themes against each other. Um, and, and they can grow and change as the movie goes and changes. Um, I, my ego is writing checks I barely cashed. Um, and, um, and, and then that became sort of the, the mandate as we, as we dug deeper into the culture and then you know, fall in love with these styles and instruments and then assign them to character over the course of the film. I will jump in on that for just a second. Early on, 
in the process, knowing that Moana's brothers went goodbye forever. Um, I remember we, we were talking to people in the studio about this movie and they said, I think 12 people in a family is kind of a lot. Maybe it should be four. And Lynn said, how about I write that opening song where I introduce everyone in the most entertaining way possible, and you're going to fall in love with everybody. And that was the first song written for the movie. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Here's a story. <laughs> That's why we have all the characters in the movie because Lynn went and wrote the song before we actually had a movie. It was the smartest yeah, movie. Yeah, it was in the sort world. of a. It was really a proof of concept of like, I can get my Howard Ashman, Alan Menken, Bell on, and at the end, you know, because Bell is like a master class. Um, it's I think it's the, one of the greatest opening numbers ever written. By the end of that opening number, you know everyone in that town. You know how they feel about each other. You know the lady who needs six eggs. You need the baker and Marie the baguettes. Hurry up! Um, and um, and it's beautiful. And you're telling the story. So I wrote the family magical, and knowing the characters' names would change, their powers would change, um, and and themes would creep in once I got around to writing those songs. Um, you'll notice this on the second viewing, um, but the first time we hear Abuela sing, she's actually singing the melody to Dos Oruguitas. Um, she, and she's singing about community and family. But once I wrote that song, I was like, okay, now I got to put Abuela's heart song back into the opening number. Um, and that's, that's the fun of building a score, is like finding what works and using every part of it to kind of build, um, to build a tapestry. I was going to ask if you learned anything, but I feel like learning that you have a kiddo on the way, it takes the cake, so. Yeah. And within well, that was the... on Moana. That wasn't on Moana. Oh, okay, sorry. My bad. Delete yeah. that. Um, <laughs> within the songwriting process, though, um, for Encanto, uh, did you learn anything along the way in the process of, of, of doing these eight original songs? Um, yeah, you're learning all the time. I mean, and again, <laughs> like, a lot of y'all are SAG members. Y'all know, like, the fun of, like, playing a part is you get to be a super expert in something for the amount of time that you are playing that part. And I got to be a Colombia expert. I got to be the strongest indestructible lady in the world. Um, a great example is um, Isabella's song, What Else Can I Do? Um, we knew she had this flower power. Um, we knew she had to write, we get to write this like rebellion song for her, um, where I finally get my mid 90s Shakira on. Um, <laughs> And I remember, I, it's, and this is where we have my wife to think. I was sort of like, you know, we were always behind deadline and we always <laughs> have no time. And I was like, I got to become an expert on Colombian flora and fauna, like really fast. Um, and she said, our neighbors at our old place. And in the first apartment my wife and I shared together, our next door neighbor is a Venezuelan botanist and he runs the New York Botanical Gardens. <laughs> And I was like, Fabian, we have to call Fabian. And I called Fabian, my old neighbor, and he said, is this about the Colombian movie? Because all my Colombian botanist friends are telling me about it. <laughs> you know, that wide world of Colombian botanists. And so uh, he already knew what I was calling about. And again, I get this master class from this incredible botanist, and what I pitched him, I said, I said, I want to know the wildest flowers that grow in Colombia, and I want to know just the wildest flowers you know that wouldn't grow in Colombia, but she can grow because she has this extraordinary power, and it's branching out in increasingly alphabet-ish ways. Um, and, um, and, you know, I got all these new words. I got jacarandas and tabebuya and, um, you know, uh, all, all of these incredible, just this incredible landscape of, of words I get to rhyme that were not in my wheelhouse before. Um, so that was like a really great example of just like the, the, the assignment means I have to become a Colombian botanist for three minutes. Um, so that was really fun. By the way, after that, because he called me, I think the next after you talked to me, you're like, don't worry, Jared, I got it all figured out. And he went through like 30 plant names in maybe 20 seconds, and it made my head explode. I had no idea what you were talking about, but you were super excited. Yeah, and I knew the animation department would flip out, because now they have to go do deep dives <laughs> and find these plants and draw them. No, they had to build them. Like, they were like, another plant? What? Does he have to do all those rhymes? And we're like, yeah, it kind of does. Yeah, there was one. There was one pita haya. We didn't get pita haya in there. That would have been nice. 
but we got a lot of them in. Um, I, there's always a moment on a Disney movie where I accidentally cost us way too much yeah, that's money. Yeah, that um, a lot. In, in Moana, because I don't know what I don't know. I just, I'm in the music department. Um, and there was a moment where uh, I'd written, I was writing the opening number for Moana, Where You Are, and it was Ron or John. Someone meekly raised their hand. They were like, do we need eight-year-old Moana? Can she just go from baby Moana to grown Moana? I went, of course we need eight-year-old Moana. Like, there's two verses, there's two chorus. The, like, she's learning these lessons over the course of her life. And he went like, okay. And I didn't realize that, like, they have to build that eight-year-old Moana from scratch. That's a million-dollar tantrum I just threw <laughs> that we need eight-year-old Moana because they'd already built baby Moana and we have our hero over the course of the movie. Um, but there's eight-year-old Moana. That eight-year-old Moana in the second verse for 20 seconds of screen time is very expensive, and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm really excited to hear the evolution of this song, Dos Orguitas. Yes. Right? Yes which translates to two caterpillars, right? Right. Yes. Um, there are Spanish and English language versions on your uh, soundtracks. Um, yeah, it's, you it's, it's the Spanish language composition for the film. And yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about the moment? And Sure. Yeah, give us the origin story. Yeah, well, you know, um, so uh, our collaborator, Sharice Castro-Smith, who is a co-writer with me as well as co-director, who's amazing, uh, phenomenal. She is yes, clap, a, clap, clap. Yeah, please, you are right please. To clap. Yes, that's correct. Um, uh, when she joined the movie, which is like three plus years ago, um, she really, really wanted to bring in this deep foundation, like magical realism has to be built on something and that deep emotion. And for the, this movie, the tragedy of Abuela Alma's life. And so this notion that she would have lost Abuelo Pedro in this one night and that from that tragedy comes this miracle was something that she built from the beginning into the foundation of the story. And so we knew that we had this really impactful backstory. The question was, when do we tell the audience how impactful it is? We found we actually had a lot of different versions where we had the entire you got the whole thing at the beginning of the movie and it felt like, oh, we're just starting. It's a little it's a little heavy. Let's put it all in the back, but don't tell the audience anything at the beginning. That didn't work because you weren't prepared. You're like, wait, the guy died? That's kind of important to know. Um, and so we kept on going back and forth. And finally, we, what we rested on was, at the beginning of the movie, you get the family backstory, and it feels like this amazing miracle. Abuela almost says to little Mirabelle, I'm going to tell you about our family. This amazing thing happened this night. Yes, I lost my husband, but it gave us this magic. And it sounds sort of like the fairy tale. Later in the movie, we realized to have the real emotion of how that felt to her, uh, that was such a critical, important scene. Uh, and the trick was, how do we, how do we get that across? Uh, dialogue didn't seem right. It felt like this is the most important musical moment. How do you make that come to life? And I think, I think, I think it was your idea, like, to not have the characters actually seeing it, right. but to yeah, have it be something different. The story didn't feel right either, because how can you put a name to that kind of a loss? Um, and so. I, I, I pitched, this song needs to feel like it's always existed. Yeah. Um, it needs to feel like a lullaby. It needs to feel like a folkloric song that you sing around a campfire. Um, and again, this is where being, being there early and, and the back and forth with all the different departments makes such a difference because the, the idea for the song came from the visuals. Um, the animation department had already created that beautiful candle flame that becomes a butterfly, um, and that butterfly is the manifestation of the miracle. And so I, I think I was on the phone with you. I was just like, I think we have this. Like, we have the metaphor of a butterfly, and that the way caterpillars turn into butterflies is already a miracle. I have read my son, Eric Carlyle's The Very Hungry Caterpillar a million times uh, every night at bedtime. So what if the song is about these two caterpillars who are in love and they don't want to let each other go, but they have to let each other go because they have to make room for the miracle and they have to make room for their next form. And suddenly I, it sounded like I was talking about something much bigger than two caterpillars. It's actually exactly what's happening to this family. This family is not falling apart because they hate each other. It's because they love each other, but they're stuck and they're frozen and they're holding on too tight. Um, and so, um, I, and then the other part, the, the decision to write it in Spanish, 
um, was a daunting one because I'm, I'm very English dominant. I have translated things from Spanish into English. I've written snippets of songs in Spanish. There's lots of Spanish in Heights, but it's always kind of marbled in with English. Um, and, um, but the metaphor is just prettier in Spanish. Sing to caterpillars. Like it's, it's suddenly a different kind of song. Um, the word chrysalis doesn't quite sing like chrysalidas. Um, the vocabulary that came up with, that came with the inspiration had to be in Spanish. Um, and so it led the way, the metaphor led the way. And I was, I was, I, I have very good conversational Spanish, but I had to go reach for my thesaurus and, and like get the poetic Spanish um, that, that the song required and I had to really dig deep for it. Um, and it was really exciting to play it for the rest of the team because uh, uh, to steal another bit of magical realism. Is anyone familiar with like water for chocolate? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you know how like she cries in the recipe and then when everyone's eating the cake, they burst into tears. That's essentially the story of this song. I was bawling while I was writing it and then everyone who hears it is also bawling. It's because I, Tita, cried in the recipe. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, and so it's, you know, and then Sebastián's incredible vocal performance takes it to a whole other, like, universe, so. Yeah, and just to, also to jump in there, I will say that when Lynn, when we were on the phone and he, and he mentioned that metaphor, there's moments where you just go, this is the most perfect thing ever. It's so emotional. I, 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 I teared up as you were saying that to me over the phone. I remember coming out of the room because we're all at home at this point. And my wife's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm, uh, I think so. And I sort of like walked out. I'm like, I need to be by myself for a little bit. Keep the kids away. Um, and then I think about these two caterpillars I just met. <laughs> yeah, she's like, are you okay? No. And then I, I, like, it was very quick when well, that song came back. And we honestly were all in tears. And the first thing I did actually was play it for my mom. And she burst into tears. And, and uh, it, it's, I will say that uh, getting one of Lynn's demos is a very, very special thing because you know it's going to be this amazing, honestly amazing piece of art that lives forever to get that the first time. And, and it's probably the most vulnerable I've actually ever heard you sing in my life, actually, oh, when that came in. It was gorgeous. Yeah. Well, you mentioned him. Sebastian Yatra recorded this. What was that like working with him? And what did his voice bring to this song? Oh, it's just gorgeous. I mean, he was, he was, and you know, it's interesting. He really wanted to do the English language version as well, because I hadn't written an English language version. I wrote the song and that took a lot. Um, and, and then he said, I, I would love to record this in English as, as well. And um, it was my first time translating myself into English, which is very, uh, was very surreal. Um, and, and I was stalling on it. I was really behind on it. And then like, finally our boss, Tom McDougall, who runs music at Disney goes, you don't actually have to translate oruguitas. You could just keep that in Spanish. I was like, fine. Because I was, I'm so in love with that word and the way it sits on the music that I was just like, let me translate everything but that. Um, and, um, but he was a dream. I mean, you, you got to work with him actually more than I did. I did. Yeah. You know, it's actually something that, that I thought was super emotional and I loved is that for this song that is the love story between Abuelo Pedro and Abuela Alma, we, we knew that that character is actually about 26 years old, which is how old Sebastian is. So the idea that this beautiful song would happen, and it's almost like you're hearing Abuelo Pedro sing this love song as you're watching it unfold was something I actually never could have predicted being a thing. It wasn't like from the beginning we knew that's what that was going to sound like, but his voice is so youthful and beautiful and vulnerable and sincere. Um, that was a, a real joy. I will say that I didn't know his music before this before this movie. Uh, Tom McDougall, uh, who's an amazing, uh, has an amazing ear for music, um, talked to us about him. Um, and there, I remember there was a night they were recording in LA and talking to Sebastian. He was so 100% uh, cued into that character, to that moment, being Colombian. He really understood what was happening, the, the history of displacement, and how much that emotionally affected him uh, was really important. And then to have a performance like that that just felt like, first off, it sounds like a song that's been around forever. I think I remember when, when Bob Iger heard that song for the first time, he's like, where did you find it? And we're like, no, no, Lynn wrote it. He's like, what? Like, he, it, it feels like it's just been around forever because it has that different vibe. And um, yeah, I think we were all like blown. We were blown away when Lynn's demo came in, when Sebastian's version came in. We were just like, uh, we're, we're done. It's a whole other thing. Um, the dance between the screenplay and dialogue and the songwriting um, and music, 
is, is really effortlessly graceful in this film. Talk about how the screenplay and dialogue really informed the music and vice versa. Oh man, I mean that's, uh, as you all can probably imagine, that's like the most fun part because I think that the greatest thing about working with Lynn is it's so collaborative and we, we actually really have to build the characters together. Meaning, it's not like we have, here's the whole script and we're done and now there's some songs. It's yeah. the whole way, we knew that we had 12 main characters. That's insane to try to pull that off. But for songs, we really have to understand who those characters are. The whole conceit of this movie is that you're presented with a certain version of a character and then you have to flip it. And those things have to be real for them to, for you to really feel them. So over the course of the movie, we would hone in on a character. I think one of the, the best examples of that is Luisa's song, is Surface Pressure. Um, and we knew that we had this very strong character who felt like she was really feeling all this responsibility, it was too much. Uh, and in early pages, usually what we do is we'll write sort of like a dummy scene that's not musicalized, but like a dummy scene of what that looks like. Uh, and I remember when Lynn took that and went away and he came back with that song and it was so inspired by your relationship with your sister, it took on a completely different meaning. And the great thing about working at Disney where you have all these bites at the apple is we could then take oh my gosh, the, the real vulnerability there and weave that in through the entire script. And so you're constantly seeing something, watching characters grow and evolve in front of your eyes and then you're able to work that all the way through. And so for every song we were able to do that um, all through the entire process. Uh, and maybe you want to talk about the Mita Bell song, which was it's almost like an inverse where we, you know, had yeah. to know the whole character. I mean, and also even even sort of wider than that, like the fact that we were telling the story of a family with three generations and 12 characters, like kind of destroys like what you think of as the Disney formula. Like we don't have time for a sidekick song. We don't have a villain. Like so throw those forms out and we have to find new forms to tell this story. And so I'm really proud of, and this is a song I pitched to us, is We Don't Talk About Bruno, um, which to me is an end of act one song, except there's no intermission uh, in a movie. But I was thinking about my favorite musicals um, when you have that great moment at the end of act one where you hear all these different themes and here's here's Valjean and here's Javert and here's Mark and here's Roger and here's Burr and here's Hamilton and then they're gonna all sing together uh, at the end and so I pitched like we need a family gossip number um, where everyone says we don't talk about that but let me tell you about that uh, which felt very Latin and true um, <laughs> Um, and I, I, I think the most autobiographical element in this movie is the way Tia Pepa and Felix try to tell the story of their wedding. That's exactly my parents telling every story, like with constantly stepping on each other and interrupting and ending with, who's telling the story, you or me? <laughs> um, that's just, that's from the Miranda household, guys. Um, <laughs> And, um, and, but again, like, it's a new form, and it's a, it was not something I'd seen in a movie before. Um, the, the, the hardest song to write, um, as, as you, uh, which you just mentioned, is Mirabelle's I Want Song, and that is, there's an incredible, an incredible tradition of I Want Songs in Disney movies, and most of your job is to not think about it and forget your writing for Disney because um, if you think about the fact that the song you're trying to write is going on a playlist with part of your world and reflection and into the unknown and I just can't wait to be king, like you're gonna poop your pants and run out of the room. Um, and so, you know, again, that's, that's another place where research saved us. Um, uh, we... I wrote a lot of pop songs for that moment. I was, I think the first draft was like a very syncopated pop song called I'm More Than What I'm Not. And then I wrote another song and that didn't work. And then I, I finally just like went back into our research and the music we listened to in Colombia. And what kept coming back to me was this bambuco form, which is a Colombian waltz. Um, and it, you know, again, it's like, it feels crazy to write a waltz for the I Want song, um, but it, it, unlocked as soon as I decided to just like, no, let me write this very specific Colombian form. Um, and, and then Mirabelle just started singing uh, and I wrote it down. Yeah, I will say also, I will mention that for the Bruno song, so you guys know every week, 
uh, on Friday nights, we would get together and we'd have our music meeting. Um, and for that song, when we were sort of walking through it, I remember Lynn said, like, I think I understand what that Bruno moment needs to be, and literally turned to his keyboard and started to play it in real time. So we watched him actually compose that song in real time before our eyes. And then I think, again, I needed to take some time away from my family and go and sit in a dark room for a little bit and calm down. That was another super highlight. Well, we're here at the end, and I know we're just about on, I'm getting, I'm getting the eyes here, but very quickly, um, I normally would ask, what do you want audiences to take away? But what do the two of you, again, very quickly, what do you want families to take away from this film? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I, we literally began this talking to our families and so quickly realized how little we knew each other. These are people that you grew up with that you think you understand. There's so much more to everyone than that. Everyone's going through their own struggles. Uh, we're going through our struggles and not showing other people that vulnerability. So I, I hope that families talk to each other after this and try to see each other differently. Yeah, I, I, we wrote this in the height of the pandemic. I was, we were an intergenerational household when this was being written. I was, I had my in-laws living with me and my, my brother-in-law, my wife's brother who, who lives alone came to live with us at the height of the pandemic. And when, when we first played, when I first played the family, we don't talk about Bruno. He was like, is this about me? <laughs> Like the weird uncle that lives in your house and does real estate, but only comes down for dinner. Um, but you know, it's, but I, I think the movie reflects that gulf between how we see ourselves and how our family sees us. Um, and, and the bridging that gap and allowing that to grow and evolve is really our life's work. So um, for, for families to be able to like have conversations about that, um, how do you see yourself in this movie? Um, how do you see me? Um, that, it's a great starting point to, to see each other more fully. Well, congrats on the film, both of you. Give it up for Lynn Manuel Miranda and Jared Bush, you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thanks for seeing a movie in a theater. Yeah, thanks everyone.